Okay, hello, good afternoon. Um, today's lecture is uh, a lecture by Mette Thompson, Mette Ramskat Thompson. Uh, she's um, a collaborator of IAC. We're very happy to to host a lecture of her. She's uh, uh, actually a faculty in the Open Thesis Fabrication Program. So some of you know her better than others. Uh, but um, it's, um, it's an architect that is, her work and her research are very much aligned with what we're doing here in the Institute. That's why we're very much interested in, showing par in, in seeing part of her research. Uh, she's leading the CETA um, Research Center in Copenhagen, which is the Center of Information and Technology and in Architecture. Uh, herself, allow me to read uh, something about her. Uh, she's an architect working with uh, digital technologies. Her research centers on the relationship between crafts and technology framed through digital crafting as a way of questioning how computation, code, material and fabrication challenge architectural thinking and material practices. Her work is uh, practice lead and through projects such as Thicket, Low Furl and some of the ones that I hope you will be showing today. She investigates the design and realization of a behavioral space. Uh, she's a professor at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts School of Architecture, where, as I said, she heads the Center for Information Technology and Architecture, uh, which is a research center that examines how new information and communication technologies have consequence for architectural practices, which is more or less some of the topics that we are also touching here at IAC. And that's why, that's why we think that we share uh, ways of thinking and ways of making. So, Mete, thank you for being here. Thank you for teaching in our program this year and help me uh, welcome her. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And it's also a great pleasure to be able to talk to more than just the unit that I am involved with in this way. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Um, I brought a lot of projects that I wanted to show um, from, from what we're doing. And, and I'm going to talk about them in respect to uh, a series of topics. They're not uh, thought about in a chronological way. It means that um, some of the projects are old, some of them are newer, and so on. They're all mixed together. And there's going to be more than 45 minutes worth, so you should tell me when you get bored, or I'll try to not get too deep into each one of them. So first of all, maybe to say that CETA is a research center for IT and architecture, and <coughs> what we've been doing for the last seven years, we've existed for seven years now, is really to try to understand how research practice within this field can try to understand technology, not necessarily or not only as something practical, not a practical tool for optimizing the techniques of architecture. Please come in, there's some seats here in the front, guys. Just um, march through. Good. <laughs> anyway, um, but also as a ground research question. So I think the most fundamental part for us in CETA is to understand that computation is a way that changes our representations, and the representations are the way that our intellectuality in architecture is cited. It means that the relationship between the way we think, the way we make, and the way that we draw is radically transformed uh, using computation. So uh, what we look at is how computers are changing the way that we work as architects, and we do this through what we call a practice-based research method. So a practice-based research method really means that we work through experiments, through one-to-one -one testing, through the building of prototypes, very similar to what you are doing here, really from an understanding that technology is something that you must do from the inside. Technology is not something that we use. Technology, te technology is something that we make or that we critically engage with. And I think this is profoundly architectural. I think the point of architecture has always been the creative troubleshooting, the creative 
misuse of tools to be able to expand the way that we think about what architecture can be. And I, I think that our tradition, I hope our tradition, continues this sort of creative um, yeah, misuse or creative uh, 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 speculation around what technology can be. Um, so uh, this has also led to that we have what we call an exhibition practice. We work very much through the exhibition as a way of building uh, or citing our prototypes. And it's an interesting place, the exhibition, because what does it really mean when an architecture becomes something that is exhibited rather than something that is inhabited? And I think often uh, I like to talk about these experiments as architecture role but not as architecture. There's a lot of things these projects do not do. They don't include, include program. They have no social context. They don't have, m most of them have no, no skin, no, <laughs> no structure, or they are purely structural proposals. And so in that case, I think it's important for us to remember that architecture is a much larger field than where these kinds of experiments um, uh, can, can sit within. So within the sort of um, limited practice or sort of by, by, by allowing ourselves a particular focus onto the computational, the structural, and the material, then we are trying to understand what the profound consequences of computation can be. We do this a lot through uh, teaching also. Um, we are very much involved with teaching. The academy is now 2,000 students, so it's a very large school. And within this very large school, we have started a very small program, which is a candidate program for computation and architecture called Archit uh, CETA Studio. Um, so we're 10 students within that. But we teach both within the wider context of the school. We teach workshops one week intensives where we come, we work with the students in the same way that we ourselves work through experimentation, both within the computational and within the material. Um, and we uh, also work with workshops outside of Denmark. So we've done a series of workshops here in Australia, um, looking at the same kinds of questions about how computation and material really touch each other. But the point being that the way we teach is also the way that we examine ourselves. We invite students into the questions that we're looking at and we um, collaborate with them, I think is the best way. Most of the projects we do in teaching are open-ended, which means that we don't know the answer as well as they don't. I think students know this immediately and I think it triggers, you know, it's fun to work on something where where it's not like, oh yeah, and this is a result that you'll come to in the end, by the way. Um, and I thought I would put this in because uh, we were very happy to be the second host of the new Smart Geometry. You were the first host here. And we, um, we were very pleased to be able to do this in 2011, where we hosted, uh, I think, 100 students and 300. It must have been the same scales as here. So anyway, so if we come back to the sort of question about how computation changes the way we think, design, and build buildings, I think what the most important thing is to really understand is that where computation maybe in the 90s was thought as something that takes us away from the world into the virtual, then I think that what's really interesting now is that computation perhaps is something that brings us closer to the material, closer to the world. Sorry guys, but there are seats right here and you're really welcome to just march through, make me nervous standing there hovering. Um, so anyway, so I think uh, this is a, a profound shift in the way that we're working with computation. And I talk of this as if it's a bit past tense. It's just because this is when I started with computers. It was very interesting to work with high-end visualization systems such as the cave as here. But of course, this exists in, in its, in its uh, still a field in much development. And uh, through things like Second Life or gaming and so on, there is a lot of work which is still about trying to understand the digital as a sort of parallel realm to where we are now. But in our work in, in CETA, what we're really interested in is really the relationship between the digital and the material. And I'm going to show this a little bit as a question, as a sort of evolution of questions <laughs> that we've been looking at. 
um, starting with some very simple questions of how digital fabrication, working directly for digital fabrication, can lead to new use of old materials. So in these two projects here, um, it's a small world, an exhibition design we did for the Danish Architecture Center and, um, and Deve. What we're trying to do, look at there, is how new fabrication techniques allow us to build very differently um, uh, with, uh, or yeah, to, to employ the materials in a new way. So in, in, in the It's a Small World, we're working with um, alu koban, which is a very simple sandwich of aluminium and plastic. I, I'm sure you know it's a quite disgusting building material often used for sort of cheap facades. Um, but what we were interested in there was really its ability to, when we score it, we can fold it and you can plastic weld it. So very few materials actually allow us to work with it in a folded fashion um, at building scale. So what we were doing here is developing this exhibition design which was really trying to look at how we could bring many different scales of engagement. It was an exhibition that would bring together architecture design and crafts and we were interested in how do you exhibit right next to each other the planning of a landscape and the fabrication of a jewel or a, a hearing aid you know what what are these scales how do we actually combine them and in this project I think for a sort of research point of view the most interesting thing was really that rather than just designing the system um, singularly and, and designing each uh, uh, element uh, one by one, what we were devising was our own information model. So our own information or sort of environment in which the information about each of these different um, moments within the design could actually implement and become this very variegated structure. So we were designing this in GC, which is an outdated program by now. Uh, it's a, the whole of four years old, this project, I think. But, um, but what was interesting is that we were designing everything from the design environment itself, where we were taking design and decisions, all the way down to fabrication, to analysis, and to the actual building of the structures. Um, so yeah, so you, you will know this world very well. Here's the plastic welding and the construction. So in this system of cassettes, which are individual open boxes that are bolted together, each box is uh, obviously um, uh, mass customized and individualized uh, and designed as these sort of growing icebergs or, or landscapes onto which the design objects were placed. Um, I think what was most interesting for us in this project was really to try to understand that rather than working in respect to sort of a BIM model which has its particular uh, libraries of understanding information in a categorized way, we were developing our own information models which were embedding the information that we specifically needed for this particular project. In Deve, we were taking that thought about the design system and, and trying to move this on. Deve wor works with laser cutting and steel shape, uh, steel uh, construction and we were learning from the sort of joint practice of textile design or garment design where you do pattern cutting and uh, ship hull building. So in ship hull building and in textiles you're working with materials or anyway with steel it's a non-compressive material. It means that you can easily imagine that I take a piece of steel and I bend it in one way easily but once it's bent in this way I can't bend it in the other direction. And this means that the material is, is unif it has only one moment of, um, of bending. We were interested in trying to understand how we could use these properties of bending to be able to construct a soft shell construction. Um, <coughs> so learning from uh, the Danish designer Le Klint, who works a lot with uh, folded structures, and also the Turkish artist Ilan Kohan, who also worked with these developable structures, we were interested in trying to understand how we could use traditional stainless steel here, uh, I think it's uh, 0 0.7 millimeters or something like that, uh, and then laser cutting to be able to define patterns that would allow us to increase the material and increase the structural strength of the, of the structure 
and then uh, bolt these structures together and create a, a shell. So you can see here we're, I think this is very funny because uh, at the in the start we're both sort of trying not to get dirty and by the end we're both <laughs> rolling around on the floor trying to hold on to this piece of steel. There's a lot of energy pushed into the material as we, we, um, we wrap it into this cone into which it braces onto itself. So it's sort of like bracing in this way, it's compressed onto itself and it uses the tension of the material to gain structural strength. Um, so for us, when we were doing this project, we were very much thinking this is a sort of easy project. We're doing it next to a lot of other projects. It's very nice that this one we know we can solve very easily. Our ambition was to be able to create a generative model within the computational um, description or in the comp information model that would allow us to unroll the surface and then create the, uh, the actual patterns. But as we were working on it, we found out that actually there is no mathematical description of a creased surface. And if I can't describe it mathematically, then I can't, I can't do it computationally. And this is very interesting. So it ended up with that something that I can do with a piece of paper, like very, very easily I can do this with, with I know my hands know how to do this. I've been able to do this in Denmark. We use it for Christmas decorations. It's very, very simple little structure, but I can't do it within the computational. So this idea that we have from our tradition as architects that first we draw and then we build, I think it's inverted when we work with computation because sometimes there are things that we know how to do with our hands that are become much more complicated as we enter the digital. In the end, we started working on a collaboration with uh, Christopher Josefsson from TU Berlin who developed a mathematical formula to be able to do this. And he's actually doing his PhD now within this field because it uh, has a new mathematical value. So when we were working with this, we actually, when we were then trying to solve the project, it ended up working very much like textile designers do. We just made a lot, a lot of iterative models. We tested them in one-to-one. -one. We cut them. We checked them. We changed the pattern. We re redid it in this huge iterative loop where we were just building and building and building and slowly building up the sophistication and knowledge which could then, then be embedded into the single pattern which could then be laser cut and constructed together. So here, this was actually built for a rave festival in Copenhagen and used as a very, very big disco ball for this party. And I think uh, you can see the cables are running right through it. And um, in fact, it's, it's not necessary. We can, we can carry it from edge to edge. It does sort of swell as, as a sort of soft shell construction. But because 300 people were <laughs> dancing under this thing in the middle of the night, I was like, it's very heavy. So uh, we've decided to be very safe around how to do it. So I think um, the lessons from Deve were um, really about trying to understand that the relationship between what I know from my hands and what I know from my description do, uh, do not follow a single linear linearity. They, are, they can both be more intelligent than each other. The other thing was also that the role of the drawing changes so that rather than thinking the drawing and architecture as the simple section that slices up the building and reveals the layers of the building which are then used for information for the builder to be able to construct the building, then here we're creating descriptions that go along the surface of the building and in which all the material detail and description is embedded into this uh, singular drawing. So that instead of uh, functioning in a way that we are creating a description that is then read by the builder, then instead we are creating new kinds of descriptions that are read by the tool and that are inscribed directly into the material and has effect on how the material actually is acting and behaving. So this sort of question about how to use, especially this notion of the material bracing, the tension in the material, became a larger research subject for us and has informed a series of different projects, all looking at how we could embrace 
material tension and behavior within our digital uh, models so that we can work directly for and with material behavior in our constructions. Of course, this is tradition. It, it is not a, a new idea. And in our Nordic context, Alto would absolutely be the person that we would point to as being the person who really understood that materials have dynamic behaviors. But if I came from another context, another part of the world, these things would be equally part of my, my understanding about what it means to build, what it means to engage with material. Um, <coughs> so in this series of projects, which I think also sort of increases in complexity um, uh, during the sort of time of them, what we're trying to do is really trying to understand how do we make digital representations that are able to hold on to the complexity of working with material behavior. And I think here the main thing, the main question we're looking at is how do we embed material behavior or understanding of material behavior into the descriptions? Because it's very rare we as architects build our own buildings. We are completely dependent on being able to communicate and explain how we work with materials um, to, uh, to other people who will build our buildings for us. So the question for this project here, Thor and later Thicket, was really <coughs> to try to understand how textile principles of weaving and pleating could be used to work with very light structures. So here, um, in this building here, or in this structure here, we're trying to pleat this wall, which is made out of um, uh, three millimeter ash slats, which are then braced together with these uh, connections. So, um, in a very simple set of experiments, what we're doing is we're trying to understand how the single element bends and just tracing it with a pencil, really, using it as both ruler but also as material uh, that we'll be, we'll be build, building with, we understand how, what the minimum and the maximum of the material behavior can be. This is then embedded into a digital model which then allows us to create a design space again in which we can be able to uh, variegate this material um, behavior. So here you just see details of how the structure is being connected. It's, it's very different now where the sound is up, is it? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> I feel suddenly like I'm in a church or something. Um, and also, also that the model, of course, also spits out the digital fabrication data that is used to fabricate the structure. So what's important in both Thicket and, and um, Thor is that each element has a variegated size which creates the sort of rhythm in the structure, but also that they are braced together with these laser-cut steel brackets which each have a different angle. So and this means that the, when the material meets itself, all of these different um, uh, uh, parameters are, are mapped onto each other. So I think what was interesting in Thicket and Thor, so we were invited for the Lisbon Architectural Triennale in, in 2010-11, where we built it in the Berado Museum, which was really fun because it was 10 meters high and it just really changed the scale of operation where many of the investigations we've been done, doing until then somehow belong to the interior. Then I think when we were doing this project, we were thinking it starts becoming the same scale as a three-story building. It starts changing what it's actually pointing to. But one of the sort of more, uh, at a research level, very interesting questions was really tr trying to understand that where the model can understand how one stick bends and put this bendability into the this uh, representation, then we also understand that the softness of the single member affects and changes the softness and bendability of the second member and the third member and so on. So I think about this normally a little bit like a fence, a, a wooden fence. If you think about that you have this sort of structure, you know that the whole structure is soft as well as the single uh, element is soft. And in our representation, we didn't have any way of understanding what we call aggregate behavior. 
So together with um, uh, Anas uh, de Laurent, who is, was a research assistant in the studio at that time, we were then trying to look at how to we could sketch aggregate behavior. And working with Maya and uh, Nucleus, uh, which are very simple uh, game engines for understanding cloth simulation, um, we started developing uh, new kinds of models which had this embedded softness in t inside of them. I'll just see if I can, yeah. So you can see that the material here is set in respect to its softness. And you can also see that the material is a little bit softer than it would be in reality. The whole structure is sort of bouncing around. But it meant that we, we sort of set a question to that maybe geometry is not the only pr uh, parameter for our representations. And instead, we need, we need to be able to create soft models or models that can somehow embed and, and hold onto the actual um, uh, flexibility and stretchability of, of the materials that we are working with. So these questions were also um, guiding in Dermoid. Dermoid is a collaboration between CETA and CL. CL is um, uh, Mark Burry's research group, uh, Spatial Information Architecture Lab at um, RMIT. And we had the luck to win a two-year research guest professorship and where he became part of our institution uh, for a two-year period. And what we were doing in this project was really trying to understand how the same kinds of questions about material softness, material behavior, structural strength, and, and, um, and creating, really asking ourselves, how could we use very short members um, to be able to create large spans? So in, in wood, uh, the piece of wood becomes more expensive the, more, the longer it needs to be. And we were thinking, how could we invent new computational systems to be able to understand how to structure a shell construction, again, which would then, or a vault construction, which used just um, uh, very ordinary uh, four mil ply sheets. So uh, normal ply sheets, 240 by 120, and four mil thick. So in this project, which was based on a series of workshops, both with um, uh, students, but also researchers uh, within CETA and CL, um, we were looking at how we could uh, start working with the reciprocal uh, trust frame system. And I don't know if how many of you know reciprocal trust frame systems. They are very traditional in Japanese architecture. And they are basically work on the same system of interweaving. So if you think about that three people can sit on each other's laps, you can sort of imagine that you can do that, then this is the same structural system. You have the same sort of idea of interweaving the different members and creating uh, structural strength. It's not really a uh, reciprocal trust stream system because we lift it out of the plane of gravity. So of course, we can only sit on each other's lap as long as gravity goes like this, if we move the three people in our mind, and then they fall down. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit alive, but at the same time, it still works with this sense of sort of interwoven connectivity. And what we were very interested in here was really trying to, again, work with the bending of the wood and the tension member that was able to hold this bending into place. Um, so in the start, we worked with very simple structures, also very naive structures. We would come back before we started inventing the, the, the bracing piece of wood. We would c set them up in the morning, and then we'd come back in the, or in the evening, and then come back in the morning, and the piece would have exploded because the tension, the, the wood relaxes in time, and then the tension member becomes too strong. So. During the project, we then started developing our own information models again, our own systems for being able to develop the this, this sort of uh, uh, structural whole, and from this detail, the single members. So as you might be able to see in this sort of slightly collage, yeah, here it's easier, um, uh, work, is that in one, each member is made out of two pieces, and uh, one member is bending with the bendability of the plywood, the thin plywood, and the other member, which sort of pierces through the member, 
uh, the first member, is bracing that and holding it into place. So we have geometry at one point or in one member, and we have the softness in the other member. And we're using this sip detail with the small holes to hold the, the structure together. There's no glue. Everything is pinned or sipped together. Um, so for the structure, we again use this idea of working with the soft model or the, or the uh, nucleus um, uh, uh, engine to be able to inflate the model, um, basically just pushing air in or digital air into the structure a little bit like a soap bubble and then the whole structure would sort of renegotiate the cell sizes across it and then this would be then interfaced with uh, another digital model um, creating the digital fabrication files. So you can see. Then uh, last summer we were invited just approximately one week after we had thrown the structure out. We don't have storage in CETA, so the things die when they are over. We were invited to, uh, to build it again <laughs> with new budget, new structure uh, for the Copenhagen Design Museum. And this was really a great opportunity because I've learned over the time of the project is that it's very, very interesting to repeat the projects because it's, everything exists in respect to deadlines, everything respects, it exists in respect to budgets, and so there's always 10 ideas or 10 research goals that we are not, we're not able to meet within the time of the specific project. So repeating a project really means being able to open the question for another set of, of investigations. And for um, Dermoid, the interesting thing was really to try to understand how we could use simulation as a particular tool to be able to understand more the structural performance of each member. So in the first structure in, in the exhibition um, uh, at the school, we were just looking at how, does, how, you know, we're using our own intuition and understanding is probably not going to be stronger than this and, and calibrating it in respect to our knowledge about the material at low level. And here, in, through a collaboration with UDK um, in Berlin, Christoph Gengnagel, uh, who is an engineer, we were then able to start creating our own FE models based on the analysis of a, of a single sort of standard module and understanding the performance of each of, or of this model as it, as it has impact loaded onto it. And then understanding how this uh, could link into how the whole structure would perform. And I know that these drawings are always terrible because you can't really see the difference. No, but if you look at the bending of this uh, leg here and try to find the same leg up there, you can see that the whole structure is sort of bending, twisting and bending over I under impact. So what we were trying to do there was really to try to sort of optimize the design chain, bringing in analysis into the early design phase and then being able to work for design, uh, design yeah, uh, with this knowledge of how the structure would actually perform. And here we then build it in the garden of the design museum. It wraps around a tree, it's very poetic, it has new, more elegant feet. I very, very much hated the first feet. These feet are sort of like a tent pole piercing into the ground. Um, and, oh, I forgot that picture. But what was very interesting in it was that we then scanned the structure afterwards in 3D scanning, and we were then able to compare the, the digital simulation with the design model with the actual resulting 3D scan of the structure. And I think this sort of new model for evaluating the structural performance of the, of the construction was very, very valuable for us and something we're uh, now starting a new uh, research project on really trying to understand how 3D scanning can be used to understand structural performance. So I think the second question that I'm sort of bringing down, going down into scale, that these sort of questions look or these projects point to is that as we start working with material behavior, it becomes really interesting to think about what materials are we using, why are we using particularly these materials, and could we as architects become part of the design chain that makes the materials and thereby be starting to design the behavior of these materials that ourselves in respect to the use or the context um, 
that we want to employ the materials in. So of course computation allows a new degree of complexity. I think we should think of the word new in a critical fashion. It's not like that the saw is particularly different from the saw of the industrial revolution or the saw of the carpenter but, or the milling machine, the CNC miller. It's not radically different from the, from the traditional industrial miller. But what is interesting is maybe the economy of, of, um, uh, of detailing and addressing the material changes radically when it's computer controlled. So if it maybe always was possible to do, it's now possible within a time frame that makes, you, you don't have to be a sort of Japanese uh, craftsman that can work 20 years on a single beam. You can start in introducing this kind of over detail into the structures of where we're working. So I think this project here, which you will know it's the um, uh, 3DL sales uh, from uh, North Sales, who are looking at how to make bespoke materials, has been extremely inspiring for architects during the last 10 years. I think we normally know, we hear about how these sales are cast onto these huge um, uh, 3D uh, sort of scissor, scissor robot shaped uh, massive casting tables, um, and then they place each fiber in respect to them. But what I find also very interesting is the top set of images. So at the one level, it's interesting from a fabrication level, you're making site-specific materials, but also you're using um, digital simulations to be able to investigate and know more about that site. So what they're doing here is they're blowing virtual wind into their representation of the sail, understanding where the forces are actually landing into the sail, and then um, optimizing the shape and the fiber placement in respect to those simulations. I think an interesting question for us as architects is, can we learn from these practices and would they be relevant for our practice um, the way we build now? And here I think often, why should we do this? It has an enormous economical ac uh, impact, but perhaps as we become more aware of the economy of fabrication and the economy of transportation on the way that we build now, both in respect to money, but also in respect to environmental impact, then this idea of building lighter and with less material and more optimized with materials becomes m uh, more and more relevant. So somebody like Bucky Fuller, who has the famous quip, who says, Madam, how much does your building weigh? Becomes, has a, gets a new meaning in our, in our time now. I think it's really important to say, to remember, he wasn't talking about sustainability. He was talking about I rapid employ deployment and putting you know, military bases into other countries so America can invade more. Um, but uh, I think, um, Still, it's, it has a very interesting uh, um, impact on the way that we're designing now. So in this project here done by postdoc uh, Paul Nicholas and uh, Martin Tamke at CETA, what we're looking at is really trying to understand how we could design or what, what happens when we design materials but also structures at the same time. So what's the conversation between material design and structural design? So here we're working with um, uh, fiber reinforced plastics um, which are using the soft bending, so re uh, remembering the lessons from Thor and Thicket as well as Dermoid, but using the bending in the material rather than in the joint. So normally when we build these kind of structures, the whole bending moment is put into the joint. We have very sophisticated, very complicated joints that need a lot of detailing. And then we have the straight, stupid member, no, the, 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 the easy member of the complicated joint. And what we were interested in looking at here was really like how could we use very standardized joints and then put the bending moment into the actual material of the structure. And uh, also understanding that materials, of course, as they bend, as they get thicker and thinner, they bend more and less. And as they have more or less impact, they will also bend more or less. So what kind of design cycle is this where we have to understand 
where the material is in the structure and what the material is that we're placing into that structure. It becomes this sort of interesting loop between the micro and the macro scale. So here, the material itself is this, these tapes, which I've talked to Anya about today. <laughs> so um, Anya, here, you have the tapes, they're about five centimeters thick, and they're heat uh, melted together in a completely normal heat press. And what we were doing is really looking at how many different materials we would put together into one sandwich. So we, I think it went from three to eight layers, or maybe 10 layers of material and really understanding that as the, different, uh, as the material gets thicker, it becomes less bendable, or as the material gets thinner, it becomes more bendable. And understanding how that bendability is actually structured, and then creating a digital model that would be able to embody that there would be several different thicknesses, and that they could be placed dynamically across the structure. So here's the actual representation of the structure and trying to find out what thickness we will need, where the bending moment of the structure is highest, of course, in the, in the peak of the arch, and where we need the thinnest material and where we need the thicker material to be able to carry the structural load of, or the, uh, the, load of, the, of the rest of the material. And here, the final installation. So I think this idea of the scales of engagement has really been completely central to our research over the last um, uh, uh, three years and has just now resulted in a new application. We were just granted a four-year research grant where we'll be looking at these questions of complex modeling, we call it, which lies between the bars taking out the most important piece of information, <laughs> but between the macro scale, the meso scale, and the micro scale. And I think, of course, we can think about this in respect to computation, because this idea of multi-scalar modeling, we know this from a huge amount of different fields, from climatology, from, from uh, 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 social science, from economy, <coughs> this idea that the very small has impact on the very big, and they're not necessarily linear relationships. So we need to invent new kinds of models that are able to interface understanding from the small scale into the large scale. I think this is, this is radically um, different from how we work right now, and we don't have tools that can do this. So we can build very good understanding about what's going on in the small scale, like the bending of the plywood in, in dermoid, but we have very, very few tools or very little understanding of how to embed that information into how the whole of the structure is moving um, together. Yeah, so this is what we will be looking at for a very long time from, from now on. So the second thing I think which is interesting for this is really the idea of when we start working with our own materials, how could we also think of these materials as active, as state shifting, and as changing in respect to the environment in which they are embedded? Um, we've done this in a series of projects, and I think this is maybe the youngest projects that I'm showing. They're all pointing a little bit in different directions, and we're not quite sure where, 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 where all of this will end. But in a series of different sort of experiments, what we're looking at is really trying to embed sensors into the material. So right now when we're looking at the bending of the, of the, of the <coughs> fiberglass or the wood or so on, we look at it really like a geometry. You know? we, we're looking at how does it bend, what's the shape of the bending. But we could also be looking at what is the pressure of the material inside of itself. And so here in a very low-tech fashion, I think quite akin to how you also work here. We're building our own pressure sensors and embedding it into this sort of sandwich of the taped material and trying to understand how this, when we interface it, um, can be linked to a digital model which can then allow us to understand what's actually going on inside of the material. And this is us baking the material, by the way, <laughs> how, how we actually are constructing the material together. And I think um, we, th this can seem a little bit far-fetched, but in reality, we don't have to look very far beyond our own um, uh, practice to find 
sensors embedded to, in materials all over the place. So we know now that in, in concrete bridges, you put sensors into the, uh, into the uh, steel to be able to, to understand the corrugation of the steel and to be able to know whether the, the bridges, like motorway bridges now, if they are, if they are in good uh, uh, state or, or not. In this project here, which is very much uh, in upstart, I'm working with um, Ayelet Kamon from uh, the Shankar University, looking at trying to understand how we can embed this sensor data from the material as feedback into the design space. Um, the idea here is very much a prototype. We're looking at um, making a curtain. So the curtain is a site-specific material, whether it's a curtain or uh, another uh, membrane could be very, it, I think it, right now we're just using it as an as a easy context for thinking. And the idea is to make a curtain that has different levels of shading within, within it um, in respect to the site uh, where it is placed. It learns from a project called Listener that we were building um, two years ago, uh, which also uses um, uh, the textile as a sort of prototype for thinking about material development. In Listener, what we're doing is we're knitting, um, using the CNC knitting machines to be able to create this um, uh, sensitive material. I'll just show you this. So it embeds, um, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, there we go. No. Okay, let me just see if I can open it in another version. Yeah. So it embeds sensors inside of it using conductive fiber. And as the uh, hand passes over the material, we're changing, we're using these uh, conductive fibers as a way of sensing uh, capacity uh, within the material. And as we use the signal of capacity to be able to control these bladders that are lying underneath the, the fabric and, and, um, and in inflate the material dynamically. So at one level, of course, the project was really about trying to find out how could we interface these, um, these uh, CNC machines here, the, the CNC knitting machine. And at another level, of course, trying to understand how we could use materials themselves to be able to use them as sensors. So rather than putting a sensor into the material, how could we knit the sensor, the sensing ability into the structure itself. This is the sort of underside where you can see the bladders that are embedded. And this is a landscape of making that you will know very well yourselves. So I think what we're working with continuously in the Israel Curtain Project is really to understand how the diagram of the structure, so how can we draw things in rhino and grasshopper, which can lead us to be able to fabricate the actual G-code that controls the machine. So here what you can see is that every, every A and every Y controls each side of the knitting bed. There are two, two beds that are controlled with each other. And out here that we can control the placement of different kinds of fibers into the material. So we were doing this also as a workshop in the, in the um, smart geometry uh, at, when they were in Copenhagen. Um, really trying to understand how we could embed these sensors into the material, but then also how could we use the information we're gaining to be able to create new generations of material. So here what we're doing is learning about the material as it's um, being developed. I wonder, oh, the video's dead. Um, and then interfacing it again back into uh, the grasshopper model to be able to uh, uh, change the parameters in respect to the site readings. I think what's interesting here is it challenges the way we think materials in architecture and what the architect's role is. 
because normally when we work right now, we work in a building, we finish the building, and then we give the keys to the person, and we leave, and some other architect, 10 years later, is invited back, and, and then uh, is doing the redesign of the facade or whatever. So this idea of the building life cycle is cut over right now, and the responsibility of the designing architect stops when the project is um, completed. But if you look to other research uh, practices, for instance, Kieran Timberlake in the US have been looking a lot about how we could, as architects, be engaged in the entire life cycle and think of buildings not as something that is completed and then it's, then it's finished, it's in its optimal condition and from then on it's just decay, but rather to be involved in the continual redressing, rethinking of the building and how we could use local sensor data to be able to ameliorate to better our buildings as they con um, are conditioned. This question of sort of material design and the state shifting uh, of materials is also what is at stake in here in Norbert Palz's PhD, which he just completed um, a, a month ago in Copenhagen, where he's using 3D printing and working with um, uh, the OPJ printer, which can work in these um, sort of uh, rubberized materials, flexible materials, to create structures that are also um, uh, state shifting. So he's looking at oxetic honeycomb structures. Oxetic materials are materials that rather than when you pull in them, then they don't get thinner, but they get fatter. It's a purely structural uh, performance. And what he's, he's looking at is really trying to understand how he, through the design process, can change and tweak this material to be able to control the actual swell or bending of the material in its, in its local um, position. Also here in a second PhD by Aurélie Mossé, um, who is looking at uh, self-actuated materials um, and, and thinking about how actuation or act smart materials could be located within the home. She's a textile designer and now doing a PhD in architecture and textiles between CETA and Central St. Martins in London. And she's looking at how she can use these electroactive po um, polymers to be able to create these state-shifted canopy which is interfaced with the, mater with the, with the uh, uh, extended environment. So um, electroactive materials are materials that are highly elastic and as you put, this is, uh, these are carbon nanotubes that are coated on either side of this very, very elastic membrane. And as she pushes in energy into it, she can make the material actually flex and contract uh, in this way here. And what she's looking at is really trying to understand how she, as a designer, can, through collaborations here with, um, with the Potsdam University and here looking at light uh, active polymers with Eindhoven University, can make the design context give new meaning to the designed, to the hyper-designed materials. These are very interesting materials. Actually, they are normally inkjet printed, so you use an inkjet printer and you print them on films. And what she's looking at is how she can use textiles as substrates to be able to uh, make these uh, energy absorbing materials. Um, right now, she can do things that are one square centimeter, so she's a little bit far from, from construction. Yeah, so the conclusions could be that this interscalar thinking that joins the idea or the understanding of what's happening at a macro scale with what's happening with a material scale sets new demands for what our representations need to be able to do. They question how it is that we draw and they in enforce new relationships between simulation and, uh, and, and design. Then I think um, another uh, important thing is also as we design for state change, then we also need to find ways of understanding how to embed that state change into our buildings. Like what does it mean actually to be able to think about materials that are continuously changing in respect to input or, or energy from their environment? How do we uh, create intelligent design solutions that use these kinds of material behaviors in, in smart ways. 
And then, of course, also to understand that the representation is at the core of all this. It's all about trying to understand how it is that we, as designers, use our design tools to be able to understand these things. And if I have one more minute of your, of your time, I think also to finish, um, it's important to remember that architecture is not only a technological field. I think it's easy to talk about. I often somehow forget and swim into technology, but I think, of course, it's a very important to remember that architecture is a poetic um, uh, endeavor as well as a, a, um, a technological uh, uh, question. So in a lot of our sort of parallel <coughs> projects, what we're looking at here is trying really to understand what is the spatial consequence of these technologies. So here, these were a set of drawings of 14 drawings we developed at the same time as thicket for the Lisbon Triennale. We were looking at, well, what is the space of this? If we say, yes, we can pleat wood constructions and we can make new kinds of walls, then what does it mean to the way that we would inhabit a space? And I like to think of these as utopia. M I don't really know, but I, I love Santelia. And I always thought that if Santelia was allowed to imagine a new world in which we could live, then maybe we were allowed to do so too. So these investigations here really try to think about what would the expression of such an architecture be in its sort of Batman comic strip sort of feel that there is maybe another world. And I am continuously finding myself wasting time or meandering off into projects that have completely different ways of questioning their presence in the space. So in this project here, um, Mountain Curtain, we're looking at how we could create spatial membranes that would allow a sort of poetic idea about uh, living in a, a mountain landscape, but also at the same time functioning as a simple curtain that you can take off the wall and hang or hang, take off the window and hang off the on the wall when you are done. And of course these projects also involve technological aspects. They question the, the textile, they question the pattern cutting, they create new, new ways of thinking about how it is the material and structure are put together. But really what they are doing is asking very different kinds of questions that have more to do with where is the site for these kinds of in investigations um, rather than just yeah, falling into technology. So the last thing to say is that we is not me. We are a large group. Um, um, uh, we are a group of, of both researchers but also PhD students. And finally, we are also always very thankful to our interns who, without whom we would never be able to build any of these things. So, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask a question about the design process. Like, how do you go about your design process? Do you choose a project to do and then decide upon a material or do you just decide upon a material and let the design process or the material kind of lead the way and kind of create its own uh, dynamic in the project. Thank you. Um, I think um, uh, it's, a, it's a good question because I think it could be answered or each project will be answered in a slightly different way. So I think in Many of the questions that we come to are very speculative in the start. We don't quite know what the answer is. And then they develop a technique. And then the second set of projects that work with this technique are very specific. Now, so we will know we will work with bending because this is a very interesting problem and we don't know how to solve it yet. And so we do a whole set of projects on bending in different ways. Also, maybe it's important to say that we, we aren't really that many people, no? So 
what we do is we work on each other's projects because we, we can't, it's impossible to do these things alone. So everything is in collaboration and in constant sort of strange tri triangulation between people. So there's a lot of knowledge transfer between projects which can have very like, so the knitting projects can suddenly inform the 3D pr printing pr uh, projects which will suddenly inform the, the fiberglass projects. Um, but at the same time, there's also the sense that every project always somehow relates to something that is built in one-to-one, -one, and so therefore relating to a particular material solution. And that material solution can be very much engaging in the performance of the material, but could also just be engaged in really trying to understand a particular tectonic solution. So the very early projects I showed with the alu carbon and so on, are really trying to just understand how do we, how do, what material can we bend with? And then we end up with this material and then we start looking at it. So there is no one way, but it's definitely something that is inherited between projects and constantly moving. Well, thank you, thank you, Mete. It's uh, a pleasure, and for us, it has been very interesting, and a lot of suggestions and a lot of things to change. And uh, I appreciate a lot, a lot of things. A lot. But uh, one is uh, the last ideas, no? This idea to to link together technology and sensibility, if you want, uh, poesy, uh, poetical things. Uh, also sensoriality, uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, also, it's not very, it's not always um, clear the use of the words, uh, words as, for example, poesy, no? but it's important also uh, in this case. The other thing is the idea of information, in the information in the core of the research. I think it's true that, uh, linking with this first idea that, uh, Perhaps this architecture that we are exchanging to the, to get together, it's evidently it's an informational architecture. But because it's informational, it's informal, in the sense that it's not so rigid that other architecture. It's more informal in the sense that it's more sensitive, it's more flexible, it's more uh, soft, it's more uh, also extroverted. Why not? It's more... Uh, mm, uh, it's more... Uh, mm, enjoying. In this case, it's more complex at the same time. And this is the last thing. You use a fantastic word. This is incredible. You use uh, active. It's full uh, in your lecture of the, the word active. And it's very curious because when I talk with the stu the, the, our students, our researchers, I say uh, the big revolution of, of our era of our digital era is not exactly the digital era. It's true in the formational era, but it's the conviction that we are in a dynamic world and in an informational world. But the information uh, do exchange, and the exchange is dynamic. But another word is active. It's true that a dynamic thing is an active thing, and we, w it's true that we can say that our architecture is an active architecture. It's not more static, it's not more um, passive, <coughs> it's active. And because it's active, uh, it's interactive, it's also relational, etc. And just the question is, why you use active, that is fantastic, eh? it's a fantastic word, and not reactive? Because reactive is, I think, all the architecture, a lot of the architecture, are you are mostly the architecture and researchers, etc., are reactive, uh, in the sense that they are active, but at the same uh, at the same time they are relational. They try to be more complex, more I don't know, flexible, and they are uh, they can be reactive. Or, uh, in some cases, it's true that the reaction is with the sensors, with the information, with the. But in other sense, uh, this architecture is true that. It's reactive because they can be more sensible to the context, to the colors, to the sensory realities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? Not only with in reactive in the sense of um, a technological aspect, in other sense. I think there is a very interesting question: the the combination between active because they are 
is dynamic and reactive because it's more interactive, no? More, uh, and perhaps you can, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> answer to this. Uh. I, I don't think I can answer, but I can reflect on the same question. I, I think, um, I think uh, it's uh, very much the modern condition that um, we are somehow understand ourselves in a, in a space fused with time. No, so with Santelia, with the start of last century, then this idea of the dynamic time space uh, became part of the way that we understand ourselves. And I think uh, this is a ground condition for where, where we're situated. And I think um, even when I was a student, I was taught materials in a categorical way. I was taught there's concrete, there's steel, there's glass, there's wood, and you can work with them in this and this and this way. And nobody ever s sort of thought to tell me that, well, wood bends or concrete corrugates or, or stone compressors or, you know, nobody, because these are outside our time frames, no? And I think for, for my own sort of, sort of, my own mental image is to understand that all of these materials are constantly changing and constantly flexing. So the weight that is being impacted into this column right now is is it is there now it is impacting right now and it's changing continuously but very very small no? and i think that sort of change to the way that we think about both the the representational space so you know with the traditional way of understanding plan and section the, the projection space of architecture is to understand it outside of time but of course with the, I don't think with computers particularly, but with the 20th century, it became fused with time and people like uh, John Cage or, or many other very important thinkers for the way that we construct ourselves as subjects have challenged what it means to, to be in space. No? So I think, yeah, these are the foundations for where we are. And computational tools just allow us to work with this idea of dynamics or acti actuation, act activeness, um, in, uh, in ways that allow us to see it because they're animated. I mean, it's very simple. <laughs> There's just many pictures after each other and they look like they're moving. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, um, it's not that it's really uh, it's not that it's radically di different, but maybe the mental image of where we are is, is different. Um, and I think the sort of difference between action and reaction, I, d I don't know if I... I think maybe it's also about not making architecture a passive responder. It doesn't just respond. I, I have a comp uh, difficulties with interaction design because I come from that tradition and I've done a lot of work in that field, but I think that why should the world respond to me? You know, why am I the most important? Maybe it's not about that I go into the smart building and the lights switch on and the windows open and the floor is soft or whatever it is, but rather that it's a conversation between the building as artifact and me as subject and that we are equal. And so this idea of the building being able to speak, having its own place within the, within the, yeah, within the, the frame of, 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 I don't know, within this conversation, I think is very important. And so I think uh, in my own work, I've become uninterested in user interaction, but very interested in vi environmental interaction. And these things are Yes, it's the same, no, it's the same senses, the same computational system and so on. But it situates the role of the building very, very differently and it situates the role of the inhabitant very, very differently. So. Right. I think you look like you want to have a drink, so uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs>